pickle brown bags in March. Good, we're recording. Uh, a couple of brown bags coming up in March will be musical. In fact, Heidi Muller will be one of them. And uh, she's going to do uh, women's songs in Women's Month. And then later in the month, we're going to have um, uh, a noon devoted to Wallawa songs. Heidi um, composed a couple of Wallawa songs, as did uh, Kate Power when she was here, and an old hand named Lenny Anderson, who um, I met 50 years ago almost, or 40 years ago in the bookstore. Anyway, they're all coming up. So, and oh, in our book, uh, our next book is Olivia Butler, and it is um, Kindred, okay? That's the next book. Okay, well, let's give it a go. Our guest today is John Frommeyer. John and I met when we were on the Humanities Council together, Oregon Humanities Council. And before that, John was involved with the, on the Oregon Arts Commission. And before that, well, I don't know where these things all fit, but he was, of course, at the National Endowment for the Arts. He's practiced law in Montana and Oregon, and I guess practiced golf in both those places, and <laughs> practiced rowing. He came up to Wallawa with his rowing skull and his skis, and uh, I don't think he's making much use of the skull right now, but... Um, he and Dan Owsley are making the rounds at the, uh, at the, what are you, right. the, the uh, um, Alpine Meadows Golf Course and Ski Course now? You so, bet. Okay. The only the other thing, so John is now living in Enterprise. We're enjoying his company here. Hope he stays. He's trying us out. And, uh, uh, and, uh, he said that he would take questions anytime, but you can also use your chat to at least make a note to yourself and then pipe up later. Or, or if you disagree vehemently with something, just yell out, okay? And with that, I'll give it to you, John. Thanks, Rich. Um, <clears throat> and good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope this is a conversation as opposed to me uh, just talking at you. Uh, and to start the conversation, I want to um, pose five philosophical questions hey. that uh, hey, I, I hope. Hey, I type this out. You guys say it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, hey. five philosophical questions. The first one is, do we have free will? The second is, can intentions without action be ethical? Okay. Number three. What's the opposite of truth? You know, you'd say, well, falsehood, but there are other answers and we should explore them. Number four, what is grace? I'm not talking about a lady. I'm talking about the uh, essence. And five, what mystical experiences have you had? I'll do the list one more time. Do we have free will? That's number one. Can intention without actions be ethical that's number two what's the opposite of truth number four what is grace and five what mystical experiences if any have you had okay so there are uh <clears throat> three books out there um all of which i have written uh that have to do with philosophy and sport the first one is I'm holding it up here. If I can get my screen to, can, can you see it on my screen? I've got Chris McClick on I, uh, that's all I can see. But anyway, th this is the book and it's called uh, Socrates, the Rower, How Rowing Informs Philosophy. Uh, this book came out right at the end of, of uh, 2016. I interrupt. Uh, it's it. available it's through my website, which is www.johnfronmeyer.com. And John, uh, excuse me, I'm going to jump in one second. Although John said he would like you to, to um, just shout out your questions, uh, I think the best way to do this is mute yourself 
until you have a question because some of the uh we're getting interference from some of your voices so mute yep. yourself until you have a question okay good all right so uh socrates the rower this book is intended to be an overview of philosophy with um intervening chapters about rowing and particularly about competitive rowing. And I developed a rowology, which can go along with ontology and epistemology and theology and all the other ologies that are uh, philosophical. It has um, eight parts and I'm gonna tell you what they are. Number one is efficiency. You can't win a race if you're not efficient. Fly and die, that's the fate of crews that go out too fast and can't sustain the pace. Life, rowing, and philosophy all share the virtue of efficiency, not wasting time, energy, emotion, and happiness are virtues. Think of these lyrics by the great American philosophers, the Eagles, you can waste all your time making money, you can spend all your love making time. Efficiency to me is getting maximum power out of each stroke, maximum benefit out of each thought, maximum enjoyment out of each day. We of rowology is steadfastness. This is an old fashioned, even biblical sounding word. What it means at its root is hanging in there. You can't quit 750 meters into a race. You owe it to your fellow crew members to die first. Woody Allen said that 95% of life is showing up, but the other 5% is a bitch. It means you are responsible both to yourself and to others. Number three is courage. There's a whole chapter in this book about physical courage, but what I mean here is moral courage, doing what you know is right no matter what the personal cost. And there will be substantial personal costs, believe me. Lost friends, lost business, lost opportunities. You've heard the saying to get along, go along. That's the moral philosophy of a salamander. Moral courage costs plenty, going along is free. Number four, being an amateur. What an insult, what a putz. Somebody who's a dabbler, a swell that has no talent. As David Hab Hab Haberstam recognized, rowers are the ultimate amateurs because there are no professionals in the sport and bless it for that. Amateur means a lover of an activity and you won't find a more romantic group than rowers. They do it because they love it and they work voluntarily and we're talking real work here lost skin, sore muscles, and an occasional unscheduled throw up. When they are supposed to be doing other work, they fantasize about rowing because it is so compelling. That's an amateur, all right. Someone who is so consumed with a sport that it becomes a philosophy of life, a metaphor, a rowology. Let's see if we can put some of the component parts together. Discipline, strength, compatibility, teamwork, athletics, fun, timing, control, power. Can you really harness all that together and still be an amateur? Absolutely. Number five is transcendence, or maybe you prefer the word spirituality, both flirt with the sublime. Transcendence, to catapult ourselves out of the earthbound into some cosmic venue, or spirituality where we cuddle up to the almighty and bask in the glory of it all. What I have in mind is a little more mundane, but it still has some of that shimmery, frosted flakiness of the great beyond. I'm talking about oneness with the water, oneness, oneness with my body, oneness with the universe. I'm thinking of motion that is continuous and seamless and fluid. I'm thinking of a mind that is completely focused and paradoxically completely at rest. Number six, self-knowledge. You can't get it without pain. A trial lawyer mentor of mine said that he never learned anything from a case that he won. That doesn't mean you go out and lose a few just for the education, but it is life's hard lessons that smack us up the side of the head. Those are the lessons that don't have to be repeated. That is why I favor racing, even if you're not strong or experienced or don't foolishly crave medals. 
forget about attention, nobody cares. Racine teaches us about ourselves, about our limitations and how we arbitrarily set them, about courage and how we seldom test it, about preparation and how we often neglect it. These are the lessons that show how plastic our lives are and how we can stretch and change and grow. Number seven is celebration. We don't celebrate enough, and that's a shame because it's one of the activities that bring us together and builds community. I'm not just talking about jumping up and down and the hugs and the high fives and the photos after the race. Celebration is in order on the nastiest day when it's cold and wet and choppy and it's raining sideways because it's a gift just to be out there doing something you love. And finally, number eight, aesthetics. Why do farmers plant flowers? Because humankind cannot live without beauty. Rowing is infused with beauty from the shape of the design of the boats to the power and the grace of the sport itself. There is beauty without noise. There is the flow of the boat through the water. There is being part of something that is somehow larger than our own lives. There's beauty in the seasons as the willows along the riverbank quick, quicken in the spring or the leaves color in the fall and the mist ebbs up from, from the water as if it were alive. There's beauty in the banks where the salmon spawn and the beavers chew and the ducks hang out. There's beauty in weighing enough, that is stopping in rowing lingo, to let a mother duck and her chicks in a line astern pass by. If you can't find beauty in that, then check to see if you have a pulse. So that's rowology for you. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you a short um, commercial for philosophy. <clears throat> Just because philosophy is maybe the most important thing that we do in our lives uh, in terms of, of learning and continuing to learn. So philosophy is what can free us from our prejudices and our misconceptions. Philosophy helps us uncloak false arguments. Philosophy gives us food for the mind. Nobody is infallible and infallibility is not what philosophy gives either. It doesn't give intellectual certainty, it gives intellectual confidence. Philosophy teaches us to love learning. The most depressing admission about higher education in the United States today is that students are paying for a degree, not an education. The only education worth having is the one where we learn to educate ourselves and for that to happen, we have to love learning. Philosophy teaches us that knowledge is aerobic, that it's a pursuit, but never a destination. Philosophy teaches us to live with uncertainty. Bertrand Russell says that philosophy's value is primarily in its uncertainty because it expands our thought and allows us to consider possibilities and frees us from the tyranny of custom. Philosophy keeps alive our sense of wonder, allowing us to approach the familiar issues from new directions. And often this can simply be by restating the issue or redefining terms. By the way, reliable studies show that thinking creatively will also help us to live longer if you care. Philosophy is calming. Because when we contemplate the, real, the really big issues, like, is there a God? And if so, how can she stand humankind? Or what is truth, beauty, or justice? Those are the metaphysical big three. We free ourselves from our petty everyday concerns, like what's for dinner? How can we pay the mortgage? And why is the sheriff knocking on the door? Uh, philosophy teaches us that the right question is more important than the right answer. It teaches us that there are limitations to the human mind. There are simply things that our minds are unable to know. So the book goes through and uh, talks about various philosophers from Plato to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and all of those in between. The one who is a favorite of most rowers is Nietzsche because he talks about the Superman and the, and the will to power. Uh, but there are all sorts of philosophers <clears throat> who can learn from rowing and vice versa. I'm just gonna read you one other thing from the rowing book and then go on to golf. And that is the chapter on choking. Choking, what an 
awful, hateful, ego-erasing disaster. We all know it. Performing at less than our best, sometimes miles below expectation. It is, my friends, a case of our minds mugging our bodies. Not all of our corpuscles are on the same team. We practice to develop muscle memory so that every stroke is the same as the one before and the one before that and the one after that into attorney forever, yeah, ever, ever and ever, amen. Arms away, body over, slow slide, quick catch, leg drive, body lay back, finish high, quick return and do it again. Like a machine, precise, powerful, unflappable until the big race, picture it. You and your teammates won all the dual meets and the regionals and you're now in the finals of the big one. Your coach, bless him, says, think what this means, men, and thereby gives you the worst advice you possibly could have because when it comes to the big one, thinking is the last thing you want to do. You want to stay loose, get a good night's sleep, let your body do what it is so superbly conditioned to do, the quasi-philosophical term for this is spezzatura, effortless, effort, effortless grace. If you dwell on what this means, you're screwed. The prefrontal cortex of your brain is where the shoot me in the foot thinking comes from. You start deconstructing your stroke, thinking about your hands, the ore depth, or that little tweak in your back, and the result is uniformly shitty. You do less than your best because your brain has tripped over your muscles. Okay, that's it for rowing. Next book up is Carrying the Clubs, What Golf Teaches Us About Ethics. I was a caddy. <clears throat> well, let me just read it. From ages 10 to 14, I caddied at the Rogue Valley Country Club in Medford, Oregon. A caddy spends a lot of time in the company of adults and is essentially invisible. The adults are in an unguarded state. I listened and I observed and I took the stories home to dinner to the dinner table. And most of the incidents were not indictable and the statute of limitations is well passed anyway. My primary caveat here is that there are likely more questions than answers about ethics. It's the nature of philosophy and why the same questions have engaged humankind since humans began living together in groups. The search for the life well lived is one that we must undertake. And the answer to what worked for the last generation may be inadequate today. To not ask the question, to not seek the answers is to, be, to forever remain a duffer in the game of life. This book, incidentally, uh, Carrying the Clubs, along with the book that's coming up next, which is Skiing and the Poetry of Snow are uh, both available at um, Copper Creek in uh, Joseph and at the Book Loft in Enterprise. They have, I think, limited copies, but if you put your name in and they contact me, I can probably get them some more. So then, here are the 10 rules of uh, being a caddy. And I was talking to, uh, Dan Asley about this and I forgot, <laughs> I forgot one of them. So just shows you that just because you written, you wrote something doesn't mean you remember it. Here are, the, here, are the, here are the 10 commandments of Caddy. Number one, stay ahead. Two, stay quiet. Three, pay attention. Four, don't step in a player's line when you're taking the pin. Number five, face the ball so that the person that's away, that is should putt next, doesn't have to ask. Number six, give advice only when asked and then be right. Number seven, watch every shot until it stops. Number eight, keep the scorecard accurately, except when told not to. Number nine, don't rattle the clubs when a player is hitting. And number 10, don't fall. Uh, we'll deal with the other 10 commandments later. I get to my next bookmark here. Okay. Shagging means something quite different across the pond in randy old England, but to caddies, it meant dumping a canvas bag of golf balls at the feet of your master 
on the practice range and trudging down however far he said <clears throat> with the bag in hand and picking up the balls as he hit them, hit them right at you. You were the target. Joe Burns, a neighbor, two years my senior, got hit right below the eye with a ball and his face swelled up flat with his nose. I don't remember any consequences and shagging continued unabated. The golf ball in the face example injects the possibility of luck into the moral equation. Joe wasn't hit by accident, he was the target. The guy who hit him probably felt bad, but he couldn't escape the possibility that the caddy would be hit. If the ball had killed him, what? Lifelong guilt for the hitter, for sure. Perhaps prosecution by a conscientious district attorney, but probably not. A civil action for wrongful death, unlikely in those days. The luck part is that all of the facts are the same, except in one case there was injury and in another case death. Luck plays a major role where you're born, who your parents are, the genes that you end up with determine your brains, your health, your physical abilities. Life isn't fair. That isn't a moral concept, it's simply the truth. The morality part is that we have to deal with it. as a young caddy because it was a prolonged opportunity to observe adults. They would swear, cheat, drink, talk about their indiscretions and otherwise display their self that their jobs and home life would never allow. Little did they know that I was absorbing all of this for the dinner, evening, dinner table's hilarity. Humiliation is both the stock and trade of both the game of golf and of humor. I heard one guy say that after he forgot his ball in the ball washer, I don't mind losing him on the course, but when I lose him in the ball washer, it's time to quit. Served him right because it was my job to wash the ball. Golf opens the floodgates of lost opportunities. It's the stream of the street of broken dreams. It strips the soul naked. It exposes our foibles. Here's a golf joke. Husband comes home, wife asks him how it went. She said, terrible, Henry died on the third hole. Oh, that's awful, says she. Yeah, I said, rest of the way it was, hit the ball, drag Henry, hit the ball, drag Henry. I knew as a kid that the country club was for relaxation, for social life, for having fun. Much of it was in contrast to the decade before, that is the decade of the 40s, which was anything but fun. Life was to be lived and to live it was to be happy. Many of my masters lost their tempers, threw their clubs, abused them, swore nonstop, turned nasty on their playing partners. Nobody plays better mad and a mad player was likely to give me a smaller tip as if it were my fault. Some say that golf is like a love affair. If you don't take it seriously, it's no fun. If you do take it seriously, it can break your heart. That may be said, but I don't believe it. Unless you are trying to make it, make a living playing golf, the less seriously you take it, the more fun you will have. And as a corollary, the better you will play. Let's face it, life isn't perfect. We make mistakes, all of us do. The law calls it negligence, golf calls it shanks and chunks and slices and hooks and tops and whiffs and four pots and yips and dubs and air mails and word burners and 404s and that's just on the front nine. Humiliation defines the game. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus tells us that man's character is his fate, so let's talk cheating. I was a naive kid, but I knew when adults were cheating. Here are a few examples. One man would mark his ball in front rather than back. When he replaced the ball, it was as much as six inches ahead of the coin. He laughed and told me that if he could mark it a couple more times, it would be a gimme, a proud cheater. Not one, but many players would hit a pot or a chip within a reasonable distance of the hole, walk up and tap it toward the hole, giving themselves the pot and pick up the ball. This isn't an indictable offense, but, but none of these, well, I suppose the question is, what was I to think? They didn't care what I thought, but there was this guy, I don't remember his name because if I did, I would print it here in bold letters, who missed a short putt, buried his putter to the hilt in the green and stalked off leaving me to retrieve the putter and repair the green as best I could. I should have left it there. Okay, that's it. 
<clears throat> for that book. Now, just very quickly to Skeen, and then uh, we'll be about halfway through this, and hopefully we can spend the rest of the time talking about <clears throat> some of these issues. In this book, Skeen and the Poetry of Snow, what I was trying to get at was that kind of mystical feeling of the world behind the world that we get when we're usually to me at least, it happens when we're out in nature. It can also be induced by various things like the beauty of nature itself, uh, the silence of nature, the danger, uh, because danger, uh, right, being right on the edge and scaring yourself is also, I think, one of the ways to get at this uh, activity. Oops, here comes a dog. Uh, hi, Dougie. Okay, let me start by giving you the, <clears throat> the definition of mysticism that comes from uh, a book that I highly commend to all of you and probably all of you know, and that is uh, William James' seminal book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which came out in uh, 1902. If you haven't read this book, uh, get it and read it. It is it's really absolutely fabulous book and his uh, um, take on various religious experiences are as true today as they were uh, 120 years ago. Okay, William James <clears throat> talks about the four characteristics of that describe mysticism. The first is what he calls ineffability, namely that it can't be described and therefore must be experienced. It's more a state of feeling than of intellect. The second characteristic of mysticism is a noetic quality, meaning that those who experience it have studied and prepared and made themselves receptive. The third is transiency, that is that it doesn't last long and it can't be reproduced, uh, remembered or, or, or really accurately described. And the fourth is passivity, and that is that the recipient, recipient can't call the experience into being even though the rehearsal and preparation may invite it. It comes and goes of its own will. And here is how uh, the poet Tennyson described it in his poem, Two Voices. Moreover, something is or seems that touches me with mystic gleams, like glimpses of forgotten dreams, of something felt like something here, of something done I know not where such as no language may declare. And the reason that there's so much poetry in this book is that poetry is absolutely the best language in which to describe mysticism. Um, poetry can be defined as the best words in the best order. And uh, poetry is philosophy uh, compressed. Um, if, if I had one recommendation if I were giving a commencement speech or something like that, it would be read a, poet, a poem every day because poems take us out of our own um, life's experience and give us something usually in a very condensed form um, that can set our minds on a whole different track. There is a chapter in this book on grace. Einstein told us that past and future are illusions and the only, only the present moment exists. So when you're standing on the cornice and there's nowhere you would rather be and no direction to go but down, you are one with the universe. You are the universe. Time has vanished. Earthly cares and troubles are gone. There is nothing but air between you and you take that leap of faith, both actual and virtual and embrace the everlasting. And then you hit, and you'd better make that first turn to gain some actual control. A state of grace such as this may last but a moment, but the euphoria can energize you for a lifetime. The beautiful moves in curves. It's true in art, it's true in religion, it's true in sport. Sure, anybody can go straight down the mountain. That's the shortest distance between two points. That's still a straight line, but the beautiful is live. It's the live body, the smooth, smooth efficient movement, the quiet torso, the effortless, effortless compression, the flawless arc of the track.
According to the writer Ursula Le Guin, one of the functions of art is to give people words to know their own experience. There are areas of vast silence in any culture. And part of the artist's job is to go into those areas and come back from the silence with something to say. And that in my view is precisely what poetry does. Just a couple more here. So now I'm going to propose some rules for aerobic meditation, to coin an oxymoron. Think of skiing as meditation where there is nothing but you and the mountain and the movement, nothing in the world. Energy is there. You just have to prepare yourself and your body to embrace it. This is a matter of witnessing, on the one hand, being hyper alert while on the other hand, relaxing into a heightened state of awareness by looking inward. And you must believe in yourself. So here are eight rules that I suggest. Number one, don't expend energy on things that don't matter. Right now, the only thing that matters is a quiet mind. Put rest to rest the rest of your life, put it on a stage and close the curtain. Rule two, Concentrate on the process, not the outcome. This shouldn't be hard because you don't know what the outcome will be. Rule three, eliminate distractions. One of the great downhill Nordic, every kind of skier, is to plug in the headphones and absolutely eliminate the possibility for self-silence. Experience, and it is an internal one. Rule number four, embrace silence. This isn't just the absence of noise, but rather the willingness to let your mind be undirected, to let it flow. Don't go with the flow, be the flow. Number five, be alone. Use the time on the chairlift to prepare your mind or as you reach toward the wilderness to empty yourself of all thoughts beyond the strides that you are taking. If there is someone there to talk to, it isn't gonna happen. Rule six, be prepared. This means not just being in shape for the activity and bringing, <clears throat> being expert enough to handle whatever train you're, terrain you're on, but being mystically balanced in such a way that you are prepared for the unexpected. How can you be prepared for the unexpected? It's a point called the pivot of the Tao, that's T-A-O, where the mind is devoid of thoughts. If that inner radiance arrives, you'll know it. Number seven, don't seek to understand. If we can understand the ephemeral, perhaps we could put it into words. We can't do either. And rule number eight, feel the source of power and use it. Where it comes from isn't important. And let me finally uh, read you a poem. This is by Joey Harjo, who was the uh, poet laureate of the United States. Uh, she is a Native American. The, the poem is called The Song for the Deer and Myself to Return On. This morning when I looked out of the roof window before dawn and a few stars were still caught in the fragile weft of ebony night, I was overwhelmed. I sang the song Lewis taught me, a song to call the deer in creek when hunting and I am certainly hunting something as magic as deer in this city far from the hammock of my mother's belly. It works, of course, and the deer come into this room and uh, wondered at finding themselves in a house near downtown Denver. Now the deer and I are trying to figure out a song to get them back, to get all of us back, because if it works, I'm going with them. And it's too early to call Lewis and nearly too late to go home. Okay, folks, let's talk. Okay, so if you have a, uh, a question or a comment, just un unmute yourself and fire away. Nancy yeah, is I was very interested in your rowing uh, experience, and uh, it's it just uh, 
It reminded me when I was in high school and college, I was a gymnast and I was a terrible gymnast, but I really did it, you know? And uh, even in my fifties, I was still showing off doing gymnastic moves and stuff. But, uh, you know, not, not good, but passionate about it. And I think that's maybe what you're getting at. Well, I, I, I think so too. And, and one of the things about sports, it isn't true in competition but it's it's true um mostly true in skiing is that you set your own goals um and and you decide what it is you want to get out of it um and you know nobody's going to tell you that that's not the right way to, to approach it or, or or not the right goal to have uh and i and i think that that's why why people ski and particularly in downhill every skier who skis downhill even even the worst skiers have conquered fear uh, and that's that's a very positive thing. Yeah, I always wanted to be better, but I <laughs> it was a, a, a struggle. It was out of reach. Uh, the, the places I saw I could go, I didn't. <laughs> well, I tell you, I don't think that there's anything more terrifying than the than the balance beam. I mean, I I see the gymnasts, you know, completely upside down doing flips and and landing on that four inch wide beam and I think, whoa. <laughs> Questions? Uh, John Brad here. Yay. So, hey, so I, I really appreciate your thoughts about golf. And the biggest problem with golf, I think, is keeping score. In other words, <laughs> you know, when you're skiing, nobody's keeping score. You turn and you kind of have down and you make good turns, you make bad turns. And it's really, you know, great. Play golf, you make a good shot and a bad shot. Somebody's keeping score of that. So I think that's one of the goals is to just remember the good shots. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and it's, it's amazing uh, in, in golf that a good <clears throat> shot can, can keep you coming back time after time. Uh, I, I have found, <clears throat> I used to keep score uh, religiously. Uh, and I have uh, of late, because it's so depressing, uh, stopped keeping score. And I find that, that I enjoy the game absolutely as much, maybe more. But, but there, there is, a, there is a, a issue of that. I mean, so much of our lives are scored in one way or another. I mean, there are, there are uh, benchmarks that we are supposed to meet. And I think one of the the virtues of sport is is to uh, to discard those those benchmarks in in so far as we can because that's how we really uh, kind of relax and get into a different zone. So, John, uh, this is Rich. Am I muted? No. No, no, you're not. Okay. Uh, all three of the sports you chose to talk about are individual. Um, well, rowing, not rowing, I guess, although you can row singly too, but one of the joys for me of sport, and I think I've told you, you know, my, we now have the class of 60 gets on the zooms and it turns out that just willy nilly five of six, um, starting linemen from our senior year in high school in 1959 are on this damn zoom thing. And, uh, and maybe I remember more. And I was I, I got a lot of splinters in basketball, but I played town team here for years. And I remember uh, trying to explain to people that there's nothing quite like being on a three on one break and knowing and, and doing the right pass at the right time and, you know, making it. And I think that that kind of teamwork in uh, uh, or a double play in baseball or, um, you know, I, team sports, anyway, it seemed to me offer a whole different dimension. Well, and I would say, Rich, that uh, that rowing, particularly in an eight-person shell, is the ultimate team sport um, for a lot of reasons. One is that uh, either everybody gets a medal or nobody gets a medal. Yeah. There, there aren't any any uh, stars uh, in in uh, an eight-person rowing shell because. You have to learn to and be willing to trust everybody in the boat, and and one rower can absolutely screw up uh, a, a boat uh, and and essentially disable it. So, you you trust your comrades, and um, 
you know, the coxswain tells you, you know, what stroke rate to do the, the stroke, who's the person that sits the farthest back in the boat, you're all facing backwards, incidentally, um, is, is the one who everybody follows. And if you don't follow, if you're trying to do something different, um, you know, it just isn't going to work. So I, I think that there are huge lessons in that, um, trust being one of the major ones. But the, again, um, just to not to prolong the, the argument, but I think one of the things about steam, team sports, the more traditional team sports, is that you have do, people doing different things that contribute to a to an outcome. So that you have you know you have offense and defense, and you've got you've got um, uh, you've got you've got different roles that you play. And I'm sure there's some of that in rowing, but uh, by the way, there's a, uh, do you know, are you familiar with um, um, uh, Plimpton's, uh, oh, George Plimpton, you know, the guy that wrote the- Paper, paper Lion. Yeah. He had a yeah. theory about sports writing. He said that the quality of sports writing is inversely proportional to the size of the ball. And there's, <laughs> there's no good writing about football because not only is the football too big, it didn't even shape like a ball. Yeah. Uh, well, I, one of the things that you said that is reminiscent of <clears throat> watching soccer, which my kids played, and I think soccer is a wonderful game uh, called football everywhere except the United States. Uh, <clears throat> when, when they first started, it was like a little swarm of bees and all of the kids were you know, following the ball wherever the ball went. Uh, but as they became uh, more skilled, they learned to play positions and, and um, stay where they were supposed to stay. And it was, it was a marvelous thing to watch kids develop um, in, in soccer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly the, the progression from, uh, from uh, the swarm to, yeah. Well, who's gonna take on this question of free will? <clears throat> are, are we just pre-programmed and we, we have this, this uh, fantasy that we're, we're calling the shots, but there's something else that's pulling all of these strings and we're not, nothing other than pup, puppets. What, what is it? Well, I, I think it's a combination. Uh, you know, I, there's things that we know and control and there's things that we do not. How do you tell? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Dave Jensen's got a philosophy degree here too. Jensen, you better speak up on this one. Um, the, the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true philosopher. <laughs> uh, uh, to clarify, we are determined. Well, you better clarify more. That's about it. <laughs> it's just a conviction. It's a what, Dan? It's a conviction of mine. Oh. Oh. Okay. It's like I I I think it was Strauss who who said he was the best horn player in Europe, and he was asked to prove it, and he said, "I don't have to prove it. I affirm it." Well, so Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you philosophically, because uh, free will or not, we uh, um, we act daily as if we have it. We yeah, make. and that's and that's part of what determines us. But uh, <laughs> it, it does get a bit complicated. It does get complicated, right? It does get complicated. <laughs> Okay, well, so, I mean, I'm not gonna let us off the hook on that one yet, but I, I do wanna to move to this, this second question, that, and that is, can intentions without actions be ethical? Because I, I do um, wanna hear what your thoughts are on that. Can, can you intend something, not do anything and act ethically? Say that again, can you intentionally can, can you intend something in your mind uh, without doing anything about it and act ethically? 
or does ethics require, I mean, does ethical act, ethics require action? Well, my own experience is I, my brain is full of things that I could do and my time is not adequate, nor is my ability. Okay. And? And I do what I can. Okay, so, so, so capacity is, is, I think, an important limitation on, on ethics. You can't, you can't right every wrong, uh, fix everything that's wrong with the world. I'll buy that. A resounding silence here. Well, well Brad here, I, obviously there are a number of things, times that when you don't do something, that's the best, the ethics. In other words, you think of some things that you probably are better not doing and you don't do it. And my gosh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy that too. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> silence is often golden uh, and uh, often a very intelligent thing to, to, to do and say is to be silent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think when you look at ethics and when you look at uh, morals, you look at the extreme cases. And if you look at the extreme cases and you say those people in Nazi Germany who remain silent, uh, were they being ethical? They went about their lives every day. They went to the grocery store, they treated their kids well, they did everything well, but, as the, uh, but they didn't pay attention to the crematorium next door. Um, yeah. So that's the, the extreme case. Now, when the question then becomes number one, when do you get to that extreme element? Um, that's, that's the first question. When, when, you, when you're required to step forward and maybe even risk yourself. Yeah, I mean, if it costs you your life, have you done the right thing or can you live to fight another day? There, <clears throat> I, I think what this points out is that there are never uh, or very seldom uh, in ethical issues, uh, a black and a white, it's always shades of gray <clears throat> and, and, and ethical people can come down with, with uh, different answers. Um, I have uh, Brad on my screen right now, and I can't see in the background, but he has uh, the ultimate torture machine, which is called a Concept 2 ergometer. It's the indoor rowing machine. And um, those of us who have rowed competitively have spent far too much time on that machine and hate it <laughs> with a passion. But it is a, 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 a absolutely wonderful way to get in shape. Let's move uh, to this other uh, question of what, what is the opposite of truth? Let, let, let me give my context for, for asking the question. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're in a, in a crisis of truth now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in our democracy. Um, two of our branches of government, that is uh, the courts, in which you're sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. <clears throat> and Congress, uh, in which anybody who testifies to Congress is, is almost always sworn to tell the truth. Those two are uh, absolutely uh, determined by the truth, whereas the executive branch uh, is free to uh, perpetrate falsehood. Uh, uh, can, can a democracy endure under those kinds of circumstances? Yeah, I, I'm just in the process of reading Jill Lepore's book, The History of America, uh, and I find that our politics has been absolutely messy from the very start. It's amazing that we got a constitution and uh, uh, there are just battles all the way through and there's dishonesty. Uh, you know, I, I'm only part way, halfway through the court and a third of the way through the book. And, uh, you know, it's just, it shows that we've constantly had people uh, who were willing to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, lie and scheme and, and uh, do whatever to uh, get their uh, 
position as well as their uh, benefit obtained. What what is the what's the answer to that? What I mean, what what do we do about that? Well, we individually have to, uh, uh, you know, as as people who who uh, speak to one another and uh, who vote, we have to do our best. But uh, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, limitations of uh, polarization that is. Uh, you know, as far as I can see, has gone all the way back to the beginning of the uh, uh, 13 states. It is from what you know in that book, uh, our situation worse than it's been historically? I think it's actually, unfortunately, you could say it's better, but it's really terrible. <laughs> you, you know, there's another way of... Uh, of setting up the equations. And that's the equation between, um, especially when you're talking about social and political action, that's uh, the, the, the difference between an egocentric and a communitarian point of view. And there's an interesting recent study where is, is somebody using computers, you can, you can ask computers uh, to tell you how many, how often a certain you, word is used over the course of time, and you can go year by year. And a recent study shows that um, uh, that, for instance, if you plug in the word "the," it's used uniformly about the same forever. But if you plug in "we" and "I," you get vast differences. And "I" has been on the ascendancy. Um, Let's see, we, we peaked in the, uh, uh, when we got rid of the robber barons and uh, in, we peaked in the thirties and then sliding down. And then in the seventies, the eyes started taking over again. And we're at a big um, confluence of eyes right now. And so I, I think that's another way of looking at history and looking at philosophy is how egocentric it is and how, um, and how, how much empathy is part of the empathy and communitarian um, any given philosophy is. There, there's a uh, distinction that's sometimes made between Canadians and Americans, which is superficial, but I think has some element of truth. And that is um, in the United States, we talk about my rights. And in Canada, you talk about being a good neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. How about mystical experiences? Have any of you uh, be willing to share a mystical experience you've had? I, I, I'll just give you one of, of mine. I you know, talk about standing on the cornice. I was um, um, snowcat skiing at Mount Bailey down by Diamond Lake. And the last run of the day, uh, we had guides and and the, one of the guides was down at the bottom and he looked about the size of the nickel and it looked about straight down and what the hell, <laughs> I just <laughs> jumped off the cornice and, and didn't kill myself and had some of the most amazing turn, turns. Um, and that, that was mystical. I mean, I, I, I will remember that experience forever, uh, both because of its danger uh, and, and because, uh, you know, I was someplace other than the world when that was happening. Uh, I came up in a Christian uh, tradition, uh, but have since really realized that, you know, I, I may be uh, kind of ethically attending that way, but I'm not truly religious. If you know, you Houston, Houston Smith's book, The World's Religions, uh, you know, he talks about the uh, six aspects of religion as, uh, you know, authority, ritual, speculation, tradition grace and mystery. And uh, I have uh, I have trouble with those. Uh, what, what do you make of that? <laughs> trouble trouble how? Well, I, I don't uh, I don't really accept the authority of religion. I don't really uh, get my heart into ritual speculation. Uh, I sometimes think is futile. Uh, tradition, uh, you know, I think we're here to change tradition. Uh, grace, uh, 
I don't know. It, it, uh, it, it sometimes happens and sometimes it really doesn't. And uh, mystery, well, that's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of other options out there than that, than those. Uh, I, you know, I think I think religion. Um, I think a lot of us who have were brought up with religion and and are not um, uh, spirit are spiritual as opposed to religious. And I I, I think spirituality can. Yeah, embrace a lot of what religion teaches. It just doesn't have the theological baggage to go along with it. John, you have somebody that wrote a, 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 a has a comment. It's, it's back a little ways on the chat. My microphone doesn't work, but I think we have free will to seek out these beautiful places where these three activities take place. We intentionally put ourselves in the situation which bring us joy and fulfillment. That's her comment on yeah, free will. I'd say to that, I would say, oh man. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think one of the one of the reasons I'm here, uh, and one of the reasons I suspect everybody else is here uh, in, in Wallowa County is that this is one of the most beautiful places on earth, and I can't wake up but and, and not see those mountains and think, you know, this there, there's a whole lot that I that I am privileged to be a part of that I uh, didn't do anything to deserve, um, and my part of this has has got to be to preserve this and protect it and and enjoy it and revel in it. I mean that's that's part of grace as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think it's to live uh, gratefully, and that changes your behavior. No other comments what? on, oh, go ahead. Come on, all you uh, writers and readers out there and uh, amateur philosophers and skiers, no mystical experiences, no aha experiences. Um, I, I've, I've had, a few mystical experiences, but in every case afterwards, I realized I was mistaken. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think that third glass of wine can, uh, can sometimes <laughs> fool you as well. <clears throat> yeah, well, Dave, Dave, um, so, so uh, Dave would, uh, uh, what about mountain climbing and, and philosophy, Dave? Did you ever make the make any uh, any associations there, or were they kept separate in your mind? Uh, pretty much separate. Um, although I did, you know, occasionally make that mistake of thinking they were they had something to do with each other, and, and realized later that that was an error and erroneous to think that. <laughs> well. Well, okay. I, I appreciate your attention, all of you who, who tuned in. And um, these questions are never going to get solved. I think one of the, the great things about philosophy is that the uh, questions of every generation may be the same, but the answers are always different. Um, so um, thanks for tuning in. Thank you all. And uh, thank you, John. And we'll, uh, we'll adjourn now and You'll uh, you'll hear from us about the next uh, next activity coming up. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for a great conversation.